Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me in the locker room today. I'm Alan Locker. We have two talented ladies who met over 30 years ago when they were both cast on All My Children. Jennifer Bassey's career in daytime television started on Love of Life, where she played Dr. Jennifer Stark. She then landed a role on Somerset as Dorothy Conrad before she moved on to The Edge of Night, where she played Albie, Abby Walcott. Jennifer landed the plum role of Marion Colby on All My Children in 1983 and remained with the show on and off for 28 years until the show went off the air in 2011. Francesca James started her daytime career with a small role on As the World Turns before joining the cast of One Life to Live, playing the role of baby-faced killer Marcy Wade. When Marcy was killed off, All My Children created the role of Kitty, where Francesca made her mark before that character was killed off also. Fans were so upset that later on, Agnes Nixon created another role for Francesca to return a few years later. She not only uh, starred on All My Children as an actress twice, but she directed the show for a number of years before finally becoming the executive producer earning multiple Emmy Awards along the way. These two ladies have worked nonstop in film, theater, and television where their paths first crossed. I am so excited to talk to them about their numerous accomplishments and of course, their lifelong friendship. Please welcome to the locker room, Jennifer Bassey, who played Marion Colby and Francesca James. Hello, hello. Hello. Well, Alan, what a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. I hope I got it all right. <laughs> Thank you. You did. I think we should all tell everybody that I almost didn't hear today, but um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's great to be here finally. Thank you. <laughs> Fra Francesca gets the um, technical savvy award happening. today for helping you out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I get hazard pay today. I've lost. Uh oh. No, we're here. Can you okay. hear us? Jenny, can uh, you hear us? She may, oh, something froze. She may have frozen. Yeah. We'll, we'll, can you hear we'll me? Because I can't hear you guys. We can hear you. Um, if for some reason you can't hear us, you can just redo those steps and, and come back on. Are anyway, you there? it's great to be here. They say you can see me and hear me. I want to thank you for inviting me to the show today. We and can the hear fabulous you. fabulous Francesca James. <laughs> and we're having trouble connecting. Yes, we, we are, honey. We are. We, I want we, to stand by. We hear closer. you beautiful. Uh, I can't move closer to what? <laughs> I think, Alan, maybe she should uh, try this again. What do you think? Come on the Jen link then. Uh, Jennifer, can you hear us? Yeah. So I'm just, I, I would just follow the steps again. I'm gonna kick you off. Just follow the steps to come back in. Click the link and follow the steps. Okay, okay. See you later. So, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> um, you know, technology, sometimes our best friend and sometimes our worst enemy. I know, but you know, I was thinking the other day about this, you know, very challenging time that we're in and how the universe really provided th this capability for us. I could not. Yeah. Could not, could not agree. You know, I, I, I'm married with no children, but I, I don't know if you have children, but people with children and grandchildren who are you know, thousands at a of distance. miles. Yeah, at a distance. Yeah. Yes. It really has. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, think think of the, um, you know, um, what was it, 1918 or 1812, whatever the, uh, I what, you know, they were really isolated. So, yes. you know, there are some little blessings, you know, yeah. that we yeah. can, we can pull from it. There yeah. she is. She's back. I'll tell you what, I'm going to do it again. I think. My hearing aids uh, are messing up our connection. I'm going to start again. I'm getting off. I'll be right back. Uh, okay. <laughs> be right back. You know, you, you... You know what, Mom? Jenny has always known how to make an entrance. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember the first time you met her? Yes. Jennifer and I had a mutual friend 
whom I adored. She was like a surrogate mother to me. And she was uh, getting married. Her husband had passed away and she was getting married for the second time. And that's where I met Jennifer. Oh, At wow. That so be before working. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Actually, Jenny, Jenny came on all my children because I was directing at that time. Hello. Oh, okay. Are yeah. you there again? Can, can you, you hear, hear me? Yes. We, we can. can. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, go ahead, Francesca. I heard that you were saying you were. Yes, I, I, was saying, <laughs> I was saying that we met at June's wedding, honey, and um, and that I was directing when. Um, this part came up and I went up to the executive producer who was Jacqueline Babin at that time. And I said, I think I might know someone for this. And we all went out to dinner and that was that. Jenny had the role, so <laughs> it was- Oh my God. Well, Jackie Babin said to me, um, I was in my, and, and uh, never mind, kidding, kidding. And Jackie Babin said, um, uh, you have to, have to sleep with a 19-year-old. And I said, well, if he can handle it, I can handle it. And um, it, we just had so much fun. She was so funny, wasn't she? She was yes, just she was a, a great and humor course, and a brilliant producer. I never auditioned for all my children. I never yeah. auditioned. She just said, I like your skirt. I said, thank you. And I like the way you look and da, da, da. And you know what? I'm going to Bali. You're going to be working for a few months and, and have a good time. I'll see you when I get back. That was it. Well, well, it's so funny because it reminds me, reminds me I'm in 2021 and I started this because I was laid off, but I'm looking for a job and you do have to remember it's who you know. That's right. That's <laughs> you have to remember that. That's um, right. as, a, as a director, um, had they told you they were casting this part because that's not as direct, you know, as an executive producer, of course, you know that a part is coming up. But were you just close friends with that producer and knew that this role was coming? How did that? Well, you know, we we get um, outlines, right? So you uh, yeah, the breakdowns, yeah, the breakdowns. So you know, you sort of know what's coming on down the pike, and um, of course, the the seventeen year old she was sleeping with, you know, was Michael. Well, was Michael? Yeah. <laughs> And I was gonna, I was gonna get to Michael. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a pretty good um, pairing for you, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> when Francesca told you about this part, I mean, could you have ever imagined it would last on and off for twenty-eight years? Almost thirty. Well, you know, no, I did not. And 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 the <laughs> thing that 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 really disturbed me when I started on the show was it was known for comedy at that time. Everybody was doing comedy. The producer's cat was starring on the show and you know, everybody's getting laughs, you know, and, and I'm getting tomatoes thrown at me in the street <laughs> and, threatening directors and, and saying, you're a villain, you're a villain, you're a horrible human being. And so I thought, well, what can I do to make myself funny? And, and I remembered that I had uh, stood by and played in, in um, The Homecoming by Harold Pinter. And Harold Pinter talks very like Mae West in sexual pauses. And he writes sexual pauses into all his plays. So to give you an example, in the play that I did, by the way, that when I got this play on Broadway, The Homecoming, the director said, what do you think of the play? I said, well, I don't understand it. She said, no, none of us do. Even Harold doesn't understand what the play's about. <laughs> and I said, well, you're joking. She said, no, no, we're quite serious. So, um, so I read for the part. And there are these pauses like, don't be too sure though, I move my leg, but I wear underwear, which moves with me. It <laughs> captures your attention, you know? And so all these pauses. So I thought, well, if I have a line with a man who's 70 years or younger, um, and I have a line like, would you like a bite of my hamburger? I'm going to say, would you like a bite of my hamburger? And uh, the writers got it and they started writing me funny. So I became a funny villain. And being a funny villain, you have longevity. Just being a villain, you have no longevity. As, am I right, Francesca? Yes, and also, we also have to say that Michael is no slouch. Michael has a fabulous sense of humor. And together, they were really delicious. 
They oh. really were. Michael is hysterical. He's yeah. hysterical. We had more fun. I'd say, I'm going to play with your chest hair here. And then why don't you reach across my chest to get my purse off the massage? I mean, we choreographed all of our sex scenes while hysterically laughing through all of them. You know. Yeah. That is, that uh, is a great. Yeah, Michael, Michael's brilliant. So what was it Michael's like being brilliant. directed by Francesca? Well, you know, I've, I've got to tell you this. It's not because I know her and I love her and she's a very good friend. It's like having an angel around. Everyone loves her. Now, Francesca, cover your ears. Everybody <laughs> loves her. And she is because she is an actress and she's won Emmys as an actor, as a director, and as a producer, she knows how actors feel. She also mm -hmm. knows what actors need and don't need. And so she's always able to give the performers on any show she's ever worked with. You know, when she won the award for all my children um, at the Emmys when they were live years ago, the entire cast of General Hospital stood and applauded as well because she had produced General Hospital and they all loved her. Mm. So, you know, when you're that loved and you, and you trust someone, you know, Francesca said, you know, stand on your head and spit quarters out of your mouth. You know, I would try it. Maybe it wouldn't work, but I would try it because I trust her. So actors trust her and they respect yeah. her talent. And so she is, she's a I'm powerful, you money. know, when you, you walk. You're, you're, when you you're walk, paying her a lot of money. I'm paying Jenny a lot oh, of not. money. Oh, she's paying, me, she's paying me thousands. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, Ellen, you know, when I first started, when I first started directing, um, there were very few directors, uh, female directors. There were, I think there were two in all of daytime. And I was 28. I was very young. But the one thing that was important to me, because I hadn't experienced it very much as an actor, was to be able to go into the rehearsal room because, you know, daytime is very fast, mm -hmm. very, very quickly. People don't, a lot of people who are wonderful actors can't do it because it's too mm. fast. So one of the, one of my objectives was to be able to go into the rehearsal studio. And, you know, as a director, you have to have everything down before you step foot in the studio. There's no time for a mistake. But I always felt that as an actor, if I came in with something, having worked on it the night before and thought, oh, this might be interesting. And then I came up against a director who was implacable, who said, oh, no, no, I've got you doing this. That was like, oh, gosh, right? So my main objective was to be able to have things down, but then be able to say, oh, Listen, great ideas. idea. Let's yeah. do that, right? And change it. Yeah. And I think that that's, um, well, I think that that's always valuable. Well, that's collaboration, too. Yes, that's right. And that's a good collaboration. Yes. Oh, yeah. But Absolutely. it's collaborative and, and with time time. Yeah, we had an airplane. We had an airplane crash on the show, Eva LaRue and Julia, mm -hmm. uh, Julia Barr. And um, Francesca staged the whole crash in the studio. And she they got a part of a plane and they did, oh my gosh, it was just like, and that's why she won the Emmy that year for producing. Because she worked like twenty four seven on that, so well, we all, yeah, we you, all, know, you know, you. What yeah, but we all did, Jenny. We had I had a wonderful designer who was fabulous, and the actors were just uh, they were remarkable. They were remarkable. Well, you can and see it was how humble she is. You know, Alan, that was one of the first times it, it, that particular segment of of scenes was one of the first times that. Um, uh, um, computer generated things were used because oh, I went wow. to California and I and I took um, I took some video of Zuma the cliff out there and we took the shots of the the inside shots of the studio and we put them on the top of that cliff and we built a fire coming out of that plane so that it looked like wow. it were in existence but you could see the flames coming out of this plane. It was the first time it had ever been done. So we were very proud of that, but it wasn't just me, it was my entire crew. It was really, 
Special. Takes a, it takes a village. Well, well, I want to go back because I, I, I uh, for both of you, because you both start, I mean, well, Jennifer, you are an actress, but Francesca, you started acting. Yeah. Who or what influenced you on becoming actors for both of you? Francesca, if you want to go first. I Well, you know, I never really wanted to do anything else. That's all I ever wanted to do. It's all I ever remember wanting to do. But I was very, very lucky to be close to to Julie Harris. And so Julie was really my linchpin. In other words, uh, I think through her, I understood what really good work was. Um, and so that- was, was, she, was she like an acting mentor? Yes, she was. Yeah, she was. She was. And there were and, many more. And, and, that's a, and that's a talented, talented woman. Yes, she, yes, she was very- <laughs> Very talented, yes. But I don't really remember wanting to do anything else. It was just, um, it was just later on in my late twenties when I thought, oh gosh, I think I might, might be interested in that. <laughs> and, and you say twenty eight when you became a director, did you have to fight to let them allow it since well, there weren't many? I had to quit the show because. Um, Jorn Winther was producing at that time, and he was very, he was really good with women. He didn't have any misogyny. He was, he wasn't threatened by women. It was good. And at that point, daytime television was almost all women, the, the executives. Right. So I went up to Jorn and said, I think I'd like to train as a director. And, you know, I was 5'2 with hair down my waist, you know. <laughs> And he said, well, that's fine, but you're going to have to leave the show and I'm going to have to speak to the to ABC daytime. And I said, that's fine. I'll do that. He said, because if you don't do that, we'll have every actor in the studio up here lined up wanting to direct. So I said, well, that's fine. And, and so the powers that be at ABC said, that's great. We can't guarantee you a job, but if you're mm -hmm. willing to go and train without any payment, to see whether you can do this, then we're willing to give you that shot. That's, um, you know, lack for a better word coming quickly to my mind, but ballsy for you to, you know, you left a paying gig. Yeah, I did. And a, and a, a well-paying gig. Was, was it scary? Um, well, you know what was scary was the fact that it was a totally different language. Being in front of the camera, totally different from being behind the camera. And um, as much as it was my family, which made mm -hmm. it easier, um, there were still a couple of really prickly people who were very upset. And unfortunately, they were in the control room. <laughs> so, so there were certainly times when it was difficult. But I had Mary Fickett and Jenny and Ray McDonald and all, all of my, you know, People, people you grew up with. Yes, Ruthie, you, who, who, Ruthie Warren, you know, they were all like, you go, kid. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> hey, having cheerleaders is a great way to succeed. Yes. And Jennifer, for you, uh, who or what influenced you on becoming an actress? Oh. Bobby Short, Jen do you remember the singer Bobby Short? Well, mm. Bobby Short. Oh, yeah. I was a Playboy Bunny in the Chicago Club, uh, the very first club. One of the first 40 Playboy Bunnies. Don't go and look up the date. Don't know how old I am. Um, and <laughs> uh, Bobby Short said, You shouldn't be singing, Bunny. You should go to school and you should learn to be an actress. So I was reading a book of George Bernard Shaw, which I didn't understand. I didn't even finish the preface. And, and it said the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art is the best school in the world. This was written in 1904. So I wrote a letter and said, hi, my name is Joan Bassey. My name was Joan then. And I said, I'd like to come to your school. And they wrote back and they said, well, we only take three Americans a year. And we uh, take 35 people. Maybe you want to come over here and audition. And so they sent the audition. And I flew over from the Playboy Club in Chicago and got the lowest entrance marks in the <laughs> history of the World Academy of Dramatic Art. And I got in anyway. And when I graduated, I graduated top of my class with Anthony Hopkins. We tied for the gold medal and the you know, got the medal, and I came in second. And, um, and in between, 
I had to learn, uh, well, really grow up because at that point I was a young, I'd been at the book club for two years and what was going on. I'd never heard, I'd heard of Shakespeare, never read him. Now I'm in England where you do Shakespeare. And I was cast in my very first term as a fairy, Midsummer Night's Dream. And this is what I said in 1960. I didn't come all this way to play a homosexual because (laughs) in those days we called people fairies. You know, that was a long time ago. Oh, I have a lot of gay friends. I didn't come all this way to play a homosexual, you know? And they said, no, 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 it's a fairy. And I said, well, what do you mean? You know, I mean, and everybody in the class is laughing and falling on the floor. (laughs) So it had segue to 2004. I get a call from a, a man I went to school with, and he goes, it, it's me, it's it's Richard from RADA, and you still hold the record for the lowest entrance marks in the history of the school, and it's the centennial, and we'd like you to fly over, darling, and do your audition just like you did it. I said, really? And they said, yeah. I said, oh, okay. So I flew over, and I did my audition. Well, I brought the house down. I mean, it was so bad. <laughs> and I really read it exactly. So it's all Bobby Short's fault. <laughs> and um, it's all um, the book I was reading, I never finished, and then getting into England. But I'll finish by saying it was so, they were so evil because I was an American. And all mm. my classmates were, were English, of course, so you're in England. And um, they, the British teacher would say, all right, class, I want to show you the sounds Americans can't hear. I just can't hear them. All right, Joan, <laughs> say the lawyer's daughter. I say the lawyer's <laughs> daughter. She, can you hear that class? she can't hear that. She's an American. And then she said, now say the long road, Joan. I say the long road. She can't hear that either. You see, Americans can't hear. Well, I hired Laurence Olivier's speech here, and I spent the summer learning how to say the lawyer's daughter and the long road. And I came back to class and almost did that to her, you know. <laughs> I was so angry that I was picked on. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I love that. So is it true? Did you change Joan to Jennifer after your love of life character? Yes, I not for my love of life character. It was the worst experience of my life doing love of life. They were very, <laughs> very mean. And a director oh, that's, who was attacked that's awful. by one of the character actors. They almost wanted to kill him. Now, when a very gentle old man character actor attacks a director, you know there are problems. So uh, I had a very difficult time. No. In 1979, when I met my, my second late husband, uh, we, I was uh, in Albuquerque visiting some stepchildren from my first late husband, my marriage, and um, we were playing games. We changed our names. So at that point in my life, I was a character actress. And um, I so I changed my name to Jennifer. And when Luther Davis, my, my late husband, who was a playwright and a cinema, cinema writer, film writer, screenwriter, called, he said... Um, I said, no, this is Jennifer. He said, you know, that's a better name for you, Jennifer Bassey, because your sound, your name sounds like Clark Gable, Joan Bassey, whereas Jennifer Bassey sounds better. Okay, I'll make this real quick. So I do numerology. I've studied <laughs> numerology, and on the plane back, I worked out the numerology of Jennifer Bassey, spelled with an E Y, because everybody thought I was Shirley Bassey in the '60s. Nobody knew, and I spelled my name I E. But I spelled, I changed it to EY. Long story short, I changed my name. I thought the numbers are perfect and I, they won't change anything. A year later, my numerologist friend who's written about nine books called me and she said, you're going to be playing rich people the rest of your life. I said, what do you mean? She said, you made a mistake on your new name and you're going to be playing rich people. And guess what? I started playing rich people. I had done a Broadway <laughs> show with George Abbott who had directed 123 Broadway shows in his life. I think I was his 118th show or something, or 17th show. Anyway, George knew me as a character actress in this Broadway show. So he called me up and he said, Bassey, Count Bassey, he used to call me. Get over here, I want you to do a play reading for me. And I walked in 
and I'd been playing very rich people and I changed my hair from red to blonde and I walked into his office. He said, who are you? I said, it's Joan Massey. He said, what happened to you? You used to be a character actress and now you're a leading lady. Get out of here. You can't read the script. So that's what happened. So I changed my name and I changed the vibes. But I get better clothes playing rich people, so I'm much happier. <laughs> it's always about the clothes, isn't it? <laughs> it's always. Hey, Francesca. So, one life to live was it your is first. Ma it is right. Yeah, was your first major role, right? Yes. You did a small. Do you remember what your small role on As the World Turns was? Oh God, yes, because it was it was live then. Ah. Uh. It was, the, it was the end. The, the, the sweat comes, right? <laughs> it was the, the very end of doing these things live. And I played a nurse. It was just like two or three days on there. But, but like Jenny, there was a director, and I can't remember his name now, which is just as well, but he was. Paul Lammers? Yes. And that's the faint, because I worked on World Turns, but I know a lot of people talk about Paul. Paul Lammers. Oh. <laughs> God, he was just so, oh. he was so difficult. He was so difficult. Anyway, luckily that went away. And um, so the, the story about One Life to, uh, to Live is interesting because I was doing um, a play in Pennsylvania and um, the producer- where, where, where Agnes lives, right? Yes, but Ag it, wasn't, it wasn't near Aggie. It was- okay. um, near Harrisburg in that area. And it was a lovely little summer stock company. Anyway, I was doing a musical called um, Plain and Fancy about the Amish. It was in the Amish country. And so the producer of All My Children, Bud Kloss at that time, came to see a friend of his who was doing the pajama game. Just before, it was, he came to the closing night of pajama game and saw the opening night of Plain and Fancy. God knows why. He came back to New York and said, there's a girl you have to see to the producer of One Life to Live, who was Doris Quinlan at that time. And they were in the same studio. That's when the shows were half an hour. Uh -huh. So Doris Quinlan and the beautiful Joan Dincheco called me into audition. But the part was, a, I, was I was 21. The part was a 35-year-old buxom blonde. What am I doing here? What am I doing? What am I doing? Anyway, I read for it and um and they rewrote the role. Wow. So there you go. And that was my first daytime job. And they shot me off of that show. I was on that show for 14 months. <laughs> and then and wow. then they shot me. Yeah. And who did you work with there? Oh gosh. Oh, Oh, gosh, I was just, you know what, Alice Herson, who is like 92 now, I think, something like that. She'll kill me for telling you that. <laughs> She's such a beautiful human being. It was it was a great cast. Ellen Holly, who was uh, who is this beautiful, beautiful African-American actress. And Aggie wrote for her a story about passing. It was like imitation of life. And, and Ellen, I swear to you, looked like Loretta Young. She was the most beautiful mm. human being I'd ever seen in my life, probably still is. Ellen Holly, uh, Alice Herson, Doris Bellack, Nat Polin. Um, oh my gosh, let me see. Uh, well, of course, Erica came on the same time I did. Wow. So Erica started the year that I was on the show. Um, you know, you name Joe Gallison played my husband. I threw him down the stairs. <laughs> Such a nice character. <laughs> it was a great cast. Bernie Grant was on it. He was one of the great um, voiceover men. Yeah, it was. Is, is that know, when you? Go ahead. I'm going to say, you know, why it was so wonderful, honey. And even in the beginning of all of this was because almost all of the actors were New York theater actors. Mm hmm. So they were just superb, and you'd. Come That's what you miss about daytime in 2021, yeah. because you know all of as the world turns, guiding light, one life to live, all my children, another world, sir. All of them had this array of 
talented people yes. come through the for day players that just yes you know yes not <laughs> knocked it out of the park yes did you is that when you first met Agnes Nixon at One Life yes that when she cast me as the buxom blonde yes <laughs> so you know you you spent much time with her you know acting directing okay. executive producing can oh. you just in your words describe Aggie her yeah. Well, first of all, I can say I would not have the comfortable life that I have were it not for Agnes Nixon. And I have always been very grateful to Aggie because she was a champion. She was a great champion of mine. You know, after One Life to Live, I was doing theater at the Long Wharf and she called me and said, you have a role. Will you come back? I said, sure. And then they killed me off of as Kitty. And like, you know, I was doing some more theater and she called me up and said, you have a twin. <laughs> <laughs> I was the first twin on daytime television. There, there it was. Oh, were, were you? Yes. Oh, I love that. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Love that. So there, right. you know, so there I was. But the thing was that Aggie just had complete, um, complete faith in us. She loved her cast. She loved them. And she was, um, she, she was never tired. I've never seen anything like it. This woman could work because she loved it so much. She never stopped working and her, and she told great stories. You know, my feeling about what's happened to daytime, a lot of what's happened to daytime is that when these people who wrote the shows owned the shows, they could write their stories. And no matter what anybody said, they would commit to those stories and they worked. As soon as they sold the shows, then mm -hmm. people started putting their fingers in the mix. And- um, too, too many cooks in the kitchen. Yes, and, and too many uh, uninformed cooks, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that, that I can't imagine that that wasn't frustrating for Aggie. I often thought that there must have been times where I'm sure it was very lucrative to sell the shows, but I think artistically there must have been times where she was sorry she had done that. But I you loved know, her. I loved her very I, much. I, I grew up on As the World Turns and Guiding Light and then worked there. And I started this, you know, just on a whim. And uh, a friend who, who, saw that I started this, happened to see Aggie's book in a bookstore and sent it to me. Yes. I couldn't put it down. Yes. It was, it was like one of her soap operas. It was so just beautiful. Just her yes. life story was a beautiful life story. Well, and I loved her book, loved you know, it. Alan, the thing about, I, and I talk about this too much probably, but the thing that I always felt about daytime in the beginning, because I was, on, I was in the original cast of All My Children, in almost the original cast of One Life to Live. But um, in those days, Aggie um, and the other great writers, Bill and you know all the other great writers, they wrote stories where the, the core families, the Martins, the, you know, the core families, mm -hmm. yeah. they would always do what they felt was right, but they would make a mistake. And then, then they would have to make up for the mistake. But there were not hidden agendas. It was not like, it's me before you. It was everybody sort of set out to do the right thing and failed in one way or another. And then you had the villain, like Billy Clyde, who came in like, you know, mm -hmm. for six months and stirred everything up. But the family units were together. And I think that that's one of the problems today. There are too many personal agendas mm. in the story writing. And Aggie was superb at not doing that, as well as telling so many current stories, valuable stories. Well, her whole story of, of creating All My Children and that one life was first and that she almost lost the Bible to yes. All My Children on a, on a trip. Yes. Um, speaking of family, Jennifer, Marcy Walker played your daughter, right? Am I, do I? Yeah. Marcy. Yes. Marcy Walker played my daughter. 
What was, what was she like? What do you want to know about Marcy Walker? <laughs> what was she like? I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think she's a minister today. Oh, gosh. I think Marcy is a minister today. We don't talk. We're not in touch. I think yeah, but she Marcy, works with little but... children in, in, in uh, Bible school, I oh, think. Oh, here you go. Uh, Marcy, I think, was, was the best actress on daytime television. I think Marcy is a great wow. actress. You don't see her working. You can't see Marcy working. It's like this is really happening to a person. So I was kind of, I was always in awe of her. She could be difficult, trust me. But I, 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 I saw around any difficulty because I knew I was working with somebody. Oops. She froze for a minute. Yeah. You know, I was producing Santa Barbara when Marcy and A were on it. Oh, I, wow. I've never seen work like the two of them. Simple, yeah, they, simple, beautiful work. Oh my! I mean, God. that is a um, super couple. That was a super couple that just worked brilliantly. Yes, they did. Um, some some of our fans had written me with some questions. Um, Larry said, "Can you can you share memories of working with Larry Keith when he played um, when you played Kitty to his Nick Davis?" Oh gosh, yes. Well, first of all. Larry was, you know, there's a word I think that's disappearing from the culture, and that's wit. Mm. Larry was a wit. No one could tell a joke like Larry Keith. He was the most remarkable guy and um, so smart and so generous because Larry was quite a bit older than I was when I was playing uh, opposite with him. But he was so generous with me. And um, everyone adored him. Everyone adored him. And I'm really sorry that we lost him as early as we did because he was a great man. He, he did more than, um, he did a few soaps, right? Did he? Um, to... I don't know. I know he was on Children from the very beginning and uh, you know, on for quite some time. But Larry was also one of the major voiceover men in the city. Mm. He, 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 was very, uh, he worked very well in voiceovers. Yeah. Larry Keith, we were talking about. Yeah, Larry. Larry Keith, honey. Oh, Larry, right, right, right. I was telling, I was telling Alan what a wonderful week he was. He had a great sense of humor. And... Um, in the early days with the very beginning cast, it was you know a smaller cast, obviously, because it was a half an hour show. But it was quite, it was really a family. And, and in those days, you'd get your notes, you would, everybody would sit together on the floor and the director would give the notes to everybody. So you just sat there and, and also, I'm sure you know this. It's like camp. <laughs> yes. One of the good things was that because of the way they shot the show, they shot it like a play. So you shot it from beginning yeah. to end, right? And so yeah. if you were mm -hmm. in the scene in the beginning and one in the middle and one in the end, you saw everybody's, work. everybody's work. So it wasn't like today where you shoot your scenes and go home. It, you knew everybody's work. You knew what everybody was doing. Which I think is a blessing, which is a, which is really a lesson. It's 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 not you know I use the word camp, but it's really school, especially yeah. if you're a new actor or like you who you know somewhere in there you must have known directing might have been coming and just watching all of that is yeah. an educate is an education in and of itself. Yes. Um, Jennifer Mark, one of our fans, Mark was asking if you can share memories working opposite Don May and Maeve McGuire on Edge of Night. Oh my God, I've never had more fun in my entire life. Maeve is still a good friend, uh, although we've lost touch in this last year or so. In fact, I introduced her to the head writer of All My Children and she got on All My Children. Yep. She's the one that kept me on the show. I, I did one day and Maeve liked me so much. She said, I like her writer and is one of my best friends. And Lois Kibbe was on the show. Remember Lois Kibbe? Yes. That name is familiar to me. Lois Kibbe, 
niece. Well, Lois was very, like I am today, white-haired. She was very grand. And I guess, I don't know, I can't tell dirty things on this. Can I or can I? It's kind of- You fun. can. It, we, 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 we don't have the uh, standards and practices okay. here. Right. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to tell you guys, because if I, I, I was very intimidated by Lois until I did my first scene with her. So I'm sitting with Lois Kibbe, and she's the richest woman in the whole city, and white hair and very expensive clothes. And the butler comes walking toward us with tea at the dress rehearsal. And she turned to me and she said, oh, he's wearing it on the left today. And I fell <laughs> off my chair. <laughs> and I said, I love this woman. Whoever she is, I will follow her anywhere. On the day, it was live. I started when it was the last live show on television. Edge of Night was the last show to go to tape. So my first few shows were live. I was very anxious. We had uh, people like, um, uh, oh, the names, you know, names go when you get over a certain age. Um, <laughs> anyway, we have teasers. There are teasers. And two actors, Anne Flood and Forrest something. Forrest, it'll come to me. Okay. And the teaser was supposed to be live. Supposed to be, you know, Donning, sometimes it's so hard to wake up in the morning. And 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 the and his reply was her reply was just dawning. I've noticed so live, and it, you know, and the, and the literally the cameras were were shaking up and down. Live, <laughs> Forrest said, well, "You know, honey, sometimes it's really hard to get it up in the morning." Said, yes, darling, I've noticed because <laughs> that was the <laughs> the cameras were going like this up and down, up and down, and everybody was laughing. <laughs> Uh, so you, you can't hide me. the laughter. Forrest Compton. Tell me Forrest Compton. All of the folk cause on, I'm sorry, but about my hearing aids, I practically have to go like this to really hear what's being said back to me. Um, the um, Donald would tell me about all these things, but the most famous, and it is dirty, but it's my, my most favorite of all time, is an 18-year-old was just starting on As the World Turns, okay? And he's very nervous. <clears throat> and he's supposed to ring the doorbell and go, hello, Mr. Starr, I have come to call on your daughter. And she said, well, wonderful, sit down. She's upstairs, I'll go get her. Instead of what she said, ding dong, Donald May told me all these stories because he had total recall. He never forgot anything. Ding dong, hello, Mrs. Starr. I've called to come on your daughter. Oh, well, come in and sit down. She's upstairs. I'll get her. Well, at this point, everyone is screaming in the sound booth. People are crying. They're laughing. So the things that happened that even, and these, they went on to happen after they went off live. But when they were live, you could not keep them out, these faux pas that would happen. And I mean, so Donald was, is, I think he's still with us. I'm not going to refer to him as I was. Uh, delightful delightful just a warm funny wonderful man and and Maeve couldn't have been a more delicious woman and she was drop dead gorgeous she still is but as a young woman she was breathtaking elegant so, so elegant yeah mm. yes yes and and can you both uh fans were asked oops sorry um i didn't mean to do that Let's find what that is. Uh, what? Sorry. No, I'm trying to remove that. Um, Ruth Wara, can you share memories of Ruth? Oh, God, Ruthie. I adored Ruthie. Ruthie was her own woman. Ruthie was outrageous. Um, she was funny. <laughs> she was spiritual. She was generous. She was... <clears throat> determined she the funniest it, remember the the teleprompters jenny i will it, anybody who's now listening to us alan <laughs> remember yeah. ruthie and the teleprompters because <laughs> ruthie, <laughs> ruthie could not live without the teleprompters okay. so, um she would she would finish she would start a sentence here she would say oh hello good morning <laughs> how are you <laughs> 
I mean, but it didn't matter. It just didn't matter. You know, she was the, the queen of the soap and, and I adored her and I adored her for 40 years. Wonderful, wonderful woman. Classic, yeah. you know, always, always, um, she wrote, a, she wrote so many, th she gave me so many books and in them she wrote so many beautiful things, you know. I just loved her. And, and speak about, speaking about changing from acting to directing, Ruthie was one of my greatest champions. That's she awesome. had her hand in my back. I loved her. Well, That's I'm saying awesome. I'm saying ditto to everything that Francesca said, but I have a <laughs> very funny Ruth Bork story. Very funny. <laughs> Dirty as well. <laughs> we were going to Club Med. So Ruthie, can I come with you? I said, Ruth. See, you know, it's not emeralds. Whoops. Boy. Oh, uh, did we lose her? I think so. Uh, yeah. Well, Francesca, a fan a fan had an interesting question. I'd love to know the answer if because this is very funny. Yeah. David heard a rumor that you hid inside the casket for your now dead character and popped yeah. out during the final dress rehearsal. Yes. Is that true? Yes, it is. So <laughs> It was the afternoon of my funeral as Kitty. And, um, and you know, all of America was weeping. And so uh, Peter White and Robin Strasser and I had lunch. Everyone was out to lunch. We had lunch at this wonderful little uh, sort of bar restaurant across the street from the studio. And, um, and we concocted this thing that I would go, we would go back and they would help me get into the casket. <laughs> And That's great. so that when they, everybody came back, they were going to come back to that scene. So we go back and I get in the casket and Peter puts like a, 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 little, a, a packet of matches <laughs> so I can breathe in the casket, you know, so the lid doesn't go down. Right. So it doesn't close all the way. Yes. And one of our wonderful directors, Del Hughes, whom we all adore, gentle, wonderful man. Um, he was directing that day. Well, Something happened because they were supposed to come back to that scene after lunch. They didn't. They went <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> I'm in this casket for like 40 minutes, right? Oh, They're God. For them to get back. They finally get back and everybody's getting into the into the into the funeral parlor and they're all seated. They're sitting. And of course, you know, we're waiting for Susie. So. <laughs> waiting for Susie and Susie finally comes and Dell is like, we got to get, come on, everybody. We got it, time's going. We got to get out of here. So quiet, quiet, everybody, stage managers, quiet, quiet. Suddenly the room is so quiet. And from the inside of the casket, I knocked, <laughs> I knocked and they were, what, what, what was that? <laughs> and I knocked <laughs> and Peter jumped up and put the, lid of the casket up and I just sat up and I said you know what for an under five this is a bitch <laughs> <laughs> I had Brilliant. been in <laughs> literally 40 45 minutes uh, can you guys is... hear me we can yes can you hear me yes Jen. yes hello oh, oh we can I'm so sorry I got a call and we got knocked off I mean it's Mercury and retrograde. I, I want to tell you my Ruth Horrock story. Yes, please favorite. do. So she heard we were going to go off to Club Med. And I said, now, Ruthie, it's not your cup of tea. You know, we just have serapes and, and, and we nobody dresses and nobody wears emeralds and feather boas. And, and we don't get dressed up. It's just simple. It's just a simple, oh, no, I would love that. I would love that. Well, she arrived with a trunk full of feather boas and evening gowns and emerald necklaces and and you've never seen and there was we have no valets you know nobody could lift you to the second floor i mean it's a nightmare okay so she's now at club med and there's a dressed beach and a nude beach semi-nude and a nude beach okay so ruth said to me don't you want to try the nude beach i said no ruthie i don't you don't want to try the nude beach? She said, I've never done a nude beach. I said, no, Ruthie, I don't want to do a nude beach. She said, 
I think I'm going to do the nude. I said, well, that's fine. You don't want to come with me. I said, no, I don't want to come with you. Okay. So she hasn't tried it. She hasn't tried it. It's our last day and we're in Guadalupe. And my husband Luther said, where's Ruth? I said, I don't know. I'll go find her. And I found her standing with a towel around her, holding her bathing suit naked under the towel, crying on the beach. I said, Ruth, what happened? She said, I finally worked up my strength to take off my suit and do it. And that horrible man told me to put my suit back on. Yeah. And I said, how dare you? He said, this is not the nude beach. This is the death <laughs> because she looks so, so terrible. Oh, my God. That's great. So that's my story. <laughs> oh my god that's good that wow that is funny uh do you remember francesca the time she flashed everybody do you remember the time she she had a fur coat on and she was just supposed to walk down the stairs but you're too young the camera, so she got I, underneath and she came down and flashed the entire company yeah there was a time um I don't know Remember? if you've ever heard, but there was a time on the Academy Awards where a man ran through and flashed everybody. Oh, yeah. Remember I that? Remember. Yeah. It, was during, it was during that yeah. time where we decided she would flash the studio. <laughs> That's funny. I do sort of remember that. I don't remember what that was for. Yeah. They were making a statement. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Hey, Francesca, um, fans were asking, you, you, uh, working with David Canary, um, the two of you won the favorite couple from Soap Opera Digest, I believe. Oh. Um, but no. what was it like working with David? I mean, that it, it wasn't me, honey. I never worked with David. Oh, I meant Jennifer. Sorry, I meant Jennifer. Yeah. Sorry, said yeah. the wrong name. My apologies. <laughs> Jennifer, working with David? Well, you know, I could, I could really cry right now because to me david was the heart and soul of all my children as i knew all my children uh, david um never complained never said a bad word about anybody never made trouble was always kind was always generous was always considerate of the, his fellow actors was out there to extend a hand if, if anyone needed help you couldn't have met sweeter more talented man than david canary and david was gifted beyond anything i mean i it was just a present and a gift in my life to be given david canary as a husband especially Stuart, because i talked with david and i said now what's the difference between adam and david to david canary adam and and and, um, and Stuart. Stuart. and he said well adam got the brains but Stuart got the goods. <laughs> so that's why Marion was so happy. <laughs> oh, that's... Well, but you know the other thing about, about but, David. You know, he, he, he was another angel. Am I right, Francesca? Both yes, and angel? I uh, yes, yes, David was. He, he never said a bad word of, about anyone, never complained. Anyone in the studio on the other anyone. side of the camera, anyone would say, Oh, it's a hard day. Oh, thank God we've got David at the end of the day because David was just aces. He never let you down. And playing both characters, which is very difficult, you're acting against yourself. Mm. David was the very best. The The irony of his leaving us the way he did was just too bizarre. He was the, Jenny's right, at that I particular was, I, time, he was the core of that show. And is he one of the, um, mm -hmm. you were like the first who played twins, but is he one of the longest? He probably is, right? Oh, I mean. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, yes. I mean, not, not, not in a, I'm not saying this you in know, a bad way. God, they, God, all my children God. milked it for the right reason because he did play those parts so beautifully. Yes. Yep. Yep. It's funny because usually when you've got twins on a show, there's a good one and a bad one. You know, this one was, there's the smart one, and then there's the one with the heart, yes. right? That was the balance. Yeah. One lives in his head, one lives in his heart. And that was, uh, he was just wonderful. He was just a wonderful human being. Can you talk about, Francesca, about your Hi, journey Alan. to become, yeah. Yeah, Jennifer? 
Can you hear? I just want to say that I got a phone call. I can hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear? Oh, yeah. Am I gone again? You can hear nope, me? No, you're here. We can. Oh, okay. I got a call and somebody said, I, I got a call and, and someone said, David is having line memory problems. I said, no, David never has memory problems. No, no, you don't understand. David's having memory problems. I said, no, no. No, D David's father died of Alzheimer's. And, and at the end, when all my children went off the air, David was brought back to the show. And he hugged Francesca and he said, you are a beautiful woman. You know, he didn't quite remember her. And uh, we had a scene together. And he could not remember, you're my queen of hearts. And I was so excited about working with David again. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I kind of touched him and I said, now when I touch you here, you have to say queen of hearts. That's all you have to say, David. He said, I, would you think I'll remember? I said, yeah, you're going to remember it. He was such an angel. I just wept after that day, you know, because to watch anyone with Alzheimer's, but especially a man who was whose brain was as sharp and as bright and as clear as David's was, it was horrendous. It was the most horrible time. It was such but a he was a great gift. It's, it's a horrible disease, but it and it and it shows, you know, when you talk about something like, you know, where David, you know, playing two parts, think about the what he had to put in his brain, his brain worked, you yeah. know, and yeah. then this d disease yeah. that just takes it from, you know, the greatest of souls is just horrible. Yeah. Yes, yes. They used to say uh, that Duza, Eleanor Duza would say the way to stay, keep your memory is to memorize something every day, every day. And I, and I thought, oh gosh, well, that's wonderful to know. And then there was David. Every day and- Blew it to smithereens that just, I mean, no one had to memorize more than David and uh -huh. did not prevent him from getting that terrible disease. Uh -uh. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. So I was going to ask your journey to becoming executive producer. I mean, was it some, you know, you went to the execs about directing. Was it something okay. you had in the back of your mind? So I was, um, I was directing on all my children and um, I, I, after all those years of being there and I was there a long time, um, there was a, a an energy in the control room that I was not comfortable with. So I went to the the powers to be at ABC with Josie Emmerich at the time. She was mm -hmm. ABC daytime. And I said, Joe, I think I'm I'm gonna leave at the end of my contract. And she said, Oh no, don't don't leave. She said, uh, I'm going to put Joe Hardy, who was a wonderful theater director, over on loving. Um I want you to go over to Loving. And what you can do is you can work Loving and all my children uh, until this contract is over. And then if you like it at Loving and Joe likes you, you can go to Loving. I said, okay. So I go over to Joe and of course, he gives me the Christmas show, which is like the hardest show you can <laughs> Cause you gotta get a Christmas show right. Yes, that's right. Cause so, <laughs> so, so, well you do. Some fans know they expect from a show, especially, you know, if it's the first year, they have no clue. But if you've been doing, <laughs> that's right. They're going to hold it to you. <laughs> so there we are doing the Christmas show, and and as we were doing it, um, we're walking up the stairs. The studio was an impossible studio. The studio was one floor. The con the control room was on the floor above it. It was ridiculous. You're running up and down the stairs all day long. Anyway, uh, Joe said as we were working, he said, "When you're finished there, you come here." So I said, "Great." So I went over to work with Joe and then this is, I'm, I'm going to try and make this as brief as possible, but Gloria Monte was doing general hospital. No, mm -hmm. Gloria Monte had been taken off of general hospital and they were going to bring, they wanted to bring Joe from L loving to general hospital. 
So Joe was now leaving, and Mary Ellis Bunim, who started, yeah, yeah. right? She yeah, was she started Real World. That's right. right? She, yeah. She's the villain for reality <laughs> television. She is. She is. She's the one. As a matter of fact, little side story. She came in one day and she said, you know, my partner John and I, we have this idea. We want to put 10 kids in a loft down on Spring Street, put some cameras in there and shoot 24 hours a day. Well, the entire com the entire tech company of loving went, that is the stupidest idea. <laughs> anyway, here we are 20 years later. But so Joe went to General Hospital. And Joe called me and said, will you come and direct for me? And I said, Joe, really, I'm directing here. I don't really want to move my life out there to direct. He said, well, how can I get you out here? I said, well, you can give me a producing job. So he said, well, let me stay here for six months, see what happens, and I'll call you. So six months later, he called me. And that's how I went out to produce General Hospital. Then there was a series of events that could only happen in daytime, which I will not bore you with now. People being fired and hired and fired and hired. And I went from General Hospital to Santa Barbara, where I produced, then from Santa Barbara to Days of Our Lives, and then from Days of Our Lives back to General Hospital. And wow. so um, that time at General Hospital, it was Wendy Rich and me and mm. Luke Brothers and Shelley. It was a it was a bunch of women, a gaggle of women, but we had Claire Labine and Claire mm. was writing beautiful story. Oh my gosh, it was beautiful. And the show was just climbing, it was just climbing. And so we won two, while I was there, two best show Emmys. And, um, and, and ABC came to me and said, we'd like you to come back to New York and do all my children. So that's how all that happened. I produced four shows in LA and then came back to executive produce all my children. And, and for you, it's so interesting that just listening to you, Abe treated, you know, nurtured you, act, acting, directing, producing. Like you have really great people. Yes. You know, I, I, I think that's just important to say because it doesn't always happen everywhere that you go to work and that they help you grow and try okay. other try other things. Yes, but that's not to say, Alan, that believe me, there were the skunks along the way. <laughs> of course, there's people in the, you know, people get jealous, people, yes. you know, yes. many, yes. Other, many other things. Yes. I have to ask, um, what coming back and walking in that door yes. to all my children as an executive producer, what was that? feeling like it must have been uh, well over i thought surprisingly i thought very naively that it would be easier than it was um you can never go home again and i think one of the reasons was because beautiful felicia Manet bear who had been producing mm -hmm. who had been producing when i was there um the network let her go and brought me in. So mm. that was a very, it was very hard because everyone loved Felicia. I loved Felicia. And mm -hmm. we have nothing to do with what the network decides. You know, right. you know that from working there. Yeah. The network makes its decisions and then you yeah. either do it or you don't. So it took a while before um, everybody warmed up to the fact that it was okay for me to be there. And um, and then it became, you know, just a wonderful place to be. And we did some wonderful work. I was very proud of what we did there. I, I'm going to come back to that because I do. Before we go, I want to hear some of those proud things. Okay. Jennifer, Jennifer I, said, um, I didn't realize that you had filled in for Eileen Fulton on As the World Turns. And meeting you today, I can't think of somebody more, um, you know, perfect to fill in for Eileen Fulton as Lisa on that show. Like you you embody her as a as an actress. Um, how, were you, you know, was that a fun, you know, acting moment or was it difficult to fill someone's shoes? Well, it was, it was 
it was kind of a tragedy to me. So no, who I was, I, I've seen pictures of her and a little bit of vignettes, you know, but I really didn't know the character. And I told them that. I said, I would love to cover for her while she's ill. And I sent her flowers and everything, but I really didn't know what I was doing because I didn't really know the character. If I'd known right. the show, it would have been simple because we're very similar characters. You that. really you are. Know what I mean? yeah. It's very hard to come into someone else's shoes. Oh, yes. yeah. Anybody, anybody. Anybody's shoes. Yeah, it is. But you, you just, yeah. just meeting you, you, you definitely remind me of that spirit that, that, you know, her character had. Um, you also, uh, Michael you Sabat know, like, like Alicia, Alicia Lynn Shoe. Yeah. Mm. You faded out. Michael Sabatino. No, no, uh, Michael Sabatino, who uh, worked with Julie Harris, right? Uh, but you worked with Michael on All My Children. You were involved yeah. with his... What What do you remember He's about Michael? He's just... Just a child. You had two, you had two Michaels. My daughter's husband's on the show. <laughs> and he was one of them. And I would get you, letters. You, you had two very handsome Michaels. And people would say, uh, dear Jennifer, dear Jennifer, do you know you're sleeping with a murderer? It was like, did I? I, yeah, I said, yeah, I read the script. You know, I knew I was sleeping with the murderer. I, I think they think that we have cameras hidden behind our drapes and we don't know that we're being filmed. I don't know <laughs> what, what it is. Anyway, Michael was just adorable. He couldn't have been cuter or more charming or more of a gentleman. Right, Francesca? Yes, beautiful. And and he married beautiful Francesca? Crystal. Yes, yes, he yes. He did marry beautiful Crystal. Yes, yes. Um, oh. And he, he played a great character on Knox Landing with uh, yes. Julie Hart. Yes. Boy, yes. that was, that, talk about a memorable role. So yeah. Francesca, what are some of the things that stand out as an executive producer that you, that you are most proud of? Well, there's so many things. I mean, I just, I, I loved my whole team. I loved my design team. I love my producing team. You know, as a woman, I liked very much being able to promote women behind the camera. I liked awesome. that very much, and I was able to do that. Um, beautiful. Well, there's so many of them now that are doing other things, which, and I'm so proud of them. And young young women that I trained as directors, you know, that are now directing, and I, I'm so proud of that. But when I went back to all my children, Two of the things that influenced my going back, and this is, I suppose, rather exposing of my ego, my personal ego, but uh, there were two things I really wanted to accomplish. One was to see if we could get another Best Show Emmy, because up until that time, children had only won one in all the years. That's and crazy. I felt that it was because when you went in and you went into the, when you were judging, Michael, you'd go in and judge for the Emmys, which I did many, many times. There would be all of these shows and then children would come up, but children had a flavor to it that was not like any other show. It had a sort of campy kind of thing going on and it didn't, when you put it up against the other stuff, it didn't really fit. So hmm. I knew that from personal experience. I knew that I knew that because of the best show, not winning best show. And I also knew it because of Susie not winning. Because when Nin you had, 19 times it took. Yes. So when I went back, I had two things, major things I really wanted to do. One was to get Aggie another best show, and the other was to get Susie that Emmy. Was it under you? Yes. Oh, that's we did amazing. the Alexia story, and you know how they say, you know how they say Hitchcock. Hitchcock says, "Well, okay, so the man's looking out the window, but it's up to the director to decide what he's looking at and what he uh -huh. means, right? If he's looking at a child and smiling, that makes him one person. If he's looking at a murderer and smiling, that makes him another person, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so my whole team." both for the best show and Susie's, Susie's clips. We were like minutely detailed. 
as to what was there, how it worked, what it, right? And I, I don't even think Susie knows that because the award was given the year after I left. Because the awards were, I think, in May or something. And yeah, they're normally in May, correct. Yeah, and I left in April. But that was what, that was what, and, and for me, and the fact that, that my mother who was failing was at the award ceremony for best show, those were the things that mattered the most to me. Aggie had another best show and Susie got her Emmy. And Sus Susan's um, story at that time was which? It was the anorexia story. A anorexia, that's it what I thought you said. brilliantly written. Megan, Aggie and Megan wrote that. It was brilliantly done. And we cast a beautiful, slight little girl that was just heartbreaking to look at, you know? I mean, it was like the, the, the colors just conformed. You know how that happens, right? Mm -hmm. it yeah. just, we were just lucky that it all fell into place. But the I, streak is over. The streak is over. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> you know, I was there at Madison Square Garden. Yes, yes. It was you know. the best. It was the best. And Jenny's right that what I think the proudest moment of my life was when they announced our winning. And the the entire cast flooded up onto the stage, and um, I'm I'm going to cry because I saw the all my children people over here, and then I looked over, and there were the general hospital people, and for me, nothing was better than that. Nothing. That's yeah. It show it it shows what kind of you know um, camaraderie you built in those roles that you you had. Um, Jennifer, do you have a favorite story or time at All My Children? A favorite storyline at All My Children, Jennifer? Well, I mean, going to bed with, da going to bed with David Canary says it all. <laughs> Could you hear me or not? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we heard that. <laughs> I mean, David Canary and I, I mean, being given that storyline and, and, and being voted the first time any couple over 40 years old, we were in our 60s, maybe the 70s, and we were voted most favorite couple for the first time ever. Nobody had ever won favorite couple over, over 30, over 40, yeah. ever. Yeah. And it was because Francesca and our, our head writer, Megan Tavish, decided to bring two characters who would never really get together together and she brought in Marianne that's why i and don't Stuart. how unlikely was a team and then i thought yeah. i'd slept with adam when i'd really slept with Stuart. so yeah so it it, it all worked out <laughs> but the you know it, and that's it's a testament to where the we networks are always that. The the networks always talked about you know the younger couples you know right right you know uh, you know at growing up as a soap fan and then working on them I mean you know for for me as a you know teenager Don Hastings and Catherine Hayes on As the World Turns were one of my you know that yeah. the and, intergenerational thing the truth yeah. is that people people reach up. A 16-year-old wants to watch a 28-year-old, a 28-year-old, a 35-year-old. I don't know why they don't get that. <laughs> I don't get it. Don't well, get that's, it. it's sort of what you said earlier. You know, sadly, I, I think, you know, we're, we're I missing know our... That, I know that I... We didn't hear the last part, Jennifer. Uh, hello? Yeah, we didn't hear the last part. Uh, no, I'm just saying that I got married again. I got married again for the third time in my at 76 years old. So I mean That's incredible. I said, "Oh my god, you gave me so much hope." I mean, you you mean you really get married again, you know? And I said, well, <laughs> "Yeah." You know, I mean, but it's like yeah, older people can have a great, you know, uh, I did a little soap opera during the Yeah. Oh, you're freezing up. During the uh, COVID. Uh, you're, 
You're breaking up, Jennifer. We're, we're losing you. L ladies, this has been so much fun. Oh, you're lovely, Alan. Thank you so much. for. Thank you so much for doing this. I could talk to you for hours. And Jennifer, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I think she's gone, <laughs> but she's been getting back on. So she, you taught her well. Yeah. I, I, I got to send you a prize. <laughs> Jenny is nothing if not tenacious. <laughs> Here she is one more time. We'll bring her on before we say goodbye. <laughs> oh my God. Jenna Jennifer, we were saying goodbye. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. <laughs> Bye, Jenny. Listen, we're going to sign please off. Please forgive me. Uh, my phone, I've never done this without my computer. I, I'm so you, sorry you, I've gone in and out, but but it was a pleasure being here. And, and oh. my dear, my best friend up here who I love. And for you, you're a great interviewer. So thanks uh, for having us today. Thank you're you. so welcome. I want to say thank you, Stephen Bergman. Thank you for putting this together. Um, and my best wishes, his dad is not doing well. And I don't think he was tuning in today. His okay. He thinks... He thinks his dad might be on his last. So let's all pray for Steven. And, uh, but I really okay, appreciate we'll we'll He sends his love and I would thank you again. It's, it really has been a pleasure. I know the fans, I didn't even get to, I brought in questions that they had submitted earlier, but the fans were loving this. And so was bye. I have bye. a great day. Bye. 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 Th thank you. Thanks everyone. It's about You're so welcome. James. Bye baby. Bye. Bye. <laughs> time, Francesca. Bye. I love you. Bye-bye. I love you. Too. <laughs> Bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> do we end this or do you end this? Uh, I will end this. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Stephen, for bringing the ladies together. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and turn on the notification so you get reminded of all upcoming shows. Have a great day, everybody, and I will see you uh, tomorrow.